Well, hello, everyone. We're here for a different kind of episode for Peak Human. I got Matt Grabowski here who works at Nose to Tail, works at the Sabian Center. We're going to be doing a special podcast. I'm going to tee it up a little bit. This is actually going to be really informative. He's going to be asking me some questions at the end, kind of like he's acting as the audience, stuff behind the scenes, you know, asking me some questions that I don't usually answer on the show. And we're going to be talking about decentralization. That's a big topic today. I think it's the answer to a lot of the world's problems. And I do talk about it sometimes, but people may know decentralized food and farming is what we do at Nose to Tail. And I think everyone's behind that, right? Going to your rancher directly. Decentralized finance is Bitcoin, which I'm not going to talk about, but we're having an event tomorrow called Bitcoin and Beef, and it's a decentralization brunch. And it's going to be all about that. We're having speakers here from the Bitcoin community in Austin. Chef Charlie's doing amazing brisket and eggs and all kinds of other stuff. So we are going to do a bit of a preview of that event for the audience because that's not going to be recorded. That's a private event here in Austin. So we're going to do a lot of talk on decentralization, how it's going to solve a lot of problems with the world, with food farming, with healthcare, with community, with education, with finance. And we're going to get behind the scenes a little bit on me and Matt and what goes on. And I think this is gonna be a great one. I'm glad we can mix it up a little. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself very quickly. Yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity to have me on, Brian. Uh, well, uh, I'm Matt Grabowski. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a holistic lifestyle and exercise coach by trade. And that is how I got introduced to uh, the Peak Human podcast, uh, Nose to Tail, and eventually the Sapien Center. Uh, I've been listening to you, Brian, for I, I want to say it's probably almost four years now. And I remember when I first started listening, you're like, go back and listen to the, the beginning. And I was like, all right, Captain, <laughs> let's do it. And I've listened to tons of your episodes. And it's honestly probably one of the podcasts, um, other than Joe Rogan, that I recommend the most to people because it is unbiased uh, nutrition. And so I was listening to you for a really long time. And then uh, earlier this year, you had an opportunity to uh, work for Nose to Tail. And I, I applied, I got the job, and then you convinced me to <laughs> move from Charleston, South Carolina, the whole way out here to Austin, Texas, uh, which I was destined to come here and help you run Nose to Tail, help you run the Sapien Center. And I've just been, I've been loving it ever since. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, evolution, psychology, philosophy, nutrition, movement, sleep, all the things biohacking. And uh, it's just, it's, it's awesome to be on this podcast. And I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation and sharing with the audience about the importance of community and education and finance and food and how you know, the powers that be want to centralize everything and putting, um, do, doing, you know, sharing our own ways of how we can apply this, this kind of this vague term of decentralization into actually applicable things that people can do on their day to day lives to kind of help this goal, which is taking, taking the power away from these large companies, these really rich and powerful people and putting it back into the consumers to vote with their dollar to support businesses that uh, they, you know, believe in and and going from there. So I'm stoked for it. That's great, man. Yeah, he knows a lot of himself. He's a, you're a Czech practitioner. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of movement stuff. And I mean, you're an up and coming expert in your own right. So it's great to get you on the show and bounce ideas off you. And it's just great to work with you. And I, I, I mean, Austin is definitely your destiny. You came here and you have like 65 friends in like two weeks. <laughs> well, it was, you know, we did have the, the the big events when I first moved here. It was just like throwing me right into, um, you know, right into the fire with with business, with or my personal life, with uh, the social atmosphere. And, and I've been loving it. The You know, if if you are in this, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in what we call this ancestral health tribe. And Austin is just leading leading the world in this place at least at least in my opinion oh i and, think it's uh, going to go down in history as yeah this insane time where people from around the country and even the world gathered in austin and there's this movement and i do call the ancestral health 
movement, community, whatever it is, it's people who believe in kind of all these dense decentralization stuff that we're talking about, but it means that it's a diet, it's a lifestyle, it's going back to nature, it's going back to being a human. That's why it's called Sapien and Sapien Center. And mm -hmm. everyone's just on the same page. We had a mastermind on Wednesday, two nights ago, amazing, 33 people, bright, healthy, intelligent, entre entrepreneurial. It was amazing. It was so fun. And we do that stuff weekly, right? Any day of the week in Austin, you can find groups like that meeting, getting together. I feel like I'm just doing a sales pitch to Austin now. <laughs> but <laughs> well, no, that's that's it though, Brian, is like, you know, like you said, so many people are moving here. And I think that like when I first moved here, it was funny. I'm like, oh, I'm a newbie. And now I've only lived here four months, but there's so many other newbies in, in, like, like in front of me. And it's so crazy. But, you know, definitely some people are moving here for the tech jobs and other businesses to move here, just like I moved here for business. Fair, fair mm -hmm. enough. But I think it's like the local community, like people want to move here because there's this rich community and in, in all these different niches. And yeah, we have this little kind of ancestral health community, but there's the breath work community. There's the movement community. There's coaching communities that are just thriving here. And I think that is why number one, you know, the Sapien Center is kind of like your dream that you've had for a while, but you know, it is like, it's a, it's an event space where we can host these kind of communities where we can have this, this open, you know, space where people can come and gather. And, you know, something that we've talked about before is it, it kind of gets away from this, this bar scene, which, you know, they, they, it has its own place, but where's a place where we can get together with good food, with good humans, with good conversations where, oh, and feel better know, after instead of feeling terrible the next day. Exactly. And, you know, that's kind of the point of the Sapien Center. And I'm excited to share with your audience kind of the opportunities that we have for people to get involved with the Sapien Center. Um, we'll be kind of talking about that Online, throughout. Specifically, because we, yes. yes, we need to stop talking about Austin in just <laughs> who's here, because most people are not in Austin. And this Fair. is the rest of this show is for people not in Austin. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> We're not going to keep bragging about how cool it is. It's about how people can get involved in this decentralized ancestral health community from abroad, from even in around the world, Europe, whatever, we we have some ideas we've been thinking of, of how to get everyone involved. And we'll be talking about that along the way, but mainly we're gonna be trying to give good information on how we can fight the powers that be. It's like you said, the powers that be is all about centralization and people are seeing that now. I was kind of tuned into this a few years ago because I figured out the health world, the food world, you know, people get red pilled on food and health and they see, oh, it's sick care, it's not health care. But then you get red pilled on how the rest of the world works and yeah. you realize, oh, they're trying to centralize power on all levels. And, and I think most people listening understand this by now. Great episode with Dr. Zoe Harcomb. You know, she went deep and talked about like, this yeah. is what's going on on a world level. This is not a secret anymore. They say it openly. The World Economic Forum talks about the Great Reset and this and that. And it goes way well beyond just the World Economic Forum, too. I want to let people know that. It's not like, oh, okay, Klaus Schwab is just the, you know, this one controlling entity that we need to fight against. It's like, that's just one piece of it. It's not yeah. one person. It's not just like, oh, Bill Gates is trying to take over the world. It's like, no, there's so much bigger stuff going on. And it's just natural to human dynamics and how societies have always run. Yeah, I, I talk about this example, going back to the pharaohs and the Egyptians, right? It's like when we first started being able to gather, accumulate wealth through grains and storage and taxes of grains and and all that, it's it's been the same power dynamic ever since, right? It's just, it's the ruling class and then it's the, the rest of us. And I think some people just, they don't get it. They go along with their lives. And that's part of how I think it's designed is you just think, oh yeah, I'm a free thinking citizen and everything, the government's here to save me and help me and everything's great. And I think a lot of people in the last three years, especially are coming out of that. Do you see that, that they're coming out of that notion that, oh wait, no, these big powers that be are just these people trying to keep us in line. And they, it's maybe they're not all evil and they're not all after just money. It's more of just, well, it's easier to, it, they think their job is to control the masses. 
right? That's what the pharaohs were doing, or that's what the kings during the Middle Ages. It's like, yeah. we need to we need to get people food. We need to have these wars. We need to fight the enemies. You know, they, there's certain people that believe that they are God chosen to do this. And I don't think that that ever serves the individual. It's maybe easier for them to have this centralization of power and all these more laws and less freedoms because it makes everyone easier to just rule. Yeah. And I think like a, a simple example of this that I was just thinking of is like podcasts are a great example of decentralization because back, you know, even just a hundred years ago, there was, there was such a bottleneck of, of media and people that you could listen to. And you had to go through these big corporations because it was on TV and it was radio and it was talk shows and things like that. Like you right now listening to Peak Human is you participating in a decentralized form of media. And you can now listen to anybody you want. You can listen to conversations between anybody you want. And the beauty of technology allowing us to do that, right? It's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, when media first got started, right, there were these big corporations that are definitely still around today that bottleneck and, and take over a lot of, you know, legacy media will say, I, I, I like the idea of not calling it mainstream media because like, is Joe Rogan mainstream media? Yes. It's the most popular show in the world, huh. but is he part of like legacy media? Not really. Right. Uh, corporate media. Yeah. Corporate call. media. And you know, you're allowed to now listen to these podcasts and get these new ideas from all these different people. That is decentralization. It's allowing anybody, I have my own podcast, right? It's allowing mm -hmm. anybody to have their own podcast, to have these ideas, to broadcast it all over the United States and well, in the world. The thing is specific to podcasts is it is actually dense, de the only decentralized stuff other than having your own website or newsletter because all the other things are censored. I've been censored from YouTube, yeah. been censored from Instagram. We can talk about it later, but there's always a middleman. With podcasts, it actually doesn't have a middleman. I mean, I have to pay for a service. The main one's called Libsyn and they host the podcast and it goes out everywhere. And none of my podcasts have been censored. So my stuff's been taken down from YouTube. My posts have been taken down from Instagram, but my podcasts have never been censored. So that's what's great about podcasts is they go directly to any sort of pod catcher or podcast app. Yeah. And it, it can't be stopped by the powers that be. <laughs> so that, that's so that our first topic could be community because I'm just very interested in building community. We've been doing it online. That's what kind of the extension of what podcasts are. It's building community. It's talking directly to people. And I think that's one of the most powerful parts of this decentralization movement is you need your community. That's the most important thing when it comes down to it. It's like your family is your community. Your friends are your community. It's people around you and it's people around the world. And well, yeah. What do you have to say about community? I mean, we're doing it with the Sapien Center. So we're trying to do our own version of it, but that's just if you're in Austin. Yeah. And we all know how important community is. You can take the ancestral viewpoint of it, of how we grew up for millennia. Um, we evolved in millennia in these small, close-knit tribes that were foundational to our survival, to our reproduction, to our food, right? It was everything. So it is it is in our genes to have in-person, tight-knit tight -knit bonds. And especially in America, I think that our, our the ability to travel, the ability to, you know, go from Pennsylvania to Texas in a day and move everything in one day, you know, as, as positive as that, that is, um, I know that there are studies showing that like younger generations are losing their kind of longer relationships. So to use me as an example, uh, I don't see any of my high school friends that often anymore. So these are people I grew up with. I don't see them that often. And these long-term bonds, even just people that like you kind of were connected with when you were younger and then when you were in middle school or in high school and then in college, like these long-term kind of community bonds are foundational to us. Now, what can you do, right? You can form maybe newer bonds that are a lot more aligned with you in your adult life. And that's, again, like this this community aspect of organizing i think in person is number one but then number two is organizing it, you know if you need to do it online right because you want to organize with a tribe that you don't really know where it's at and that's something um you know you're doing online with the tribe the sapien tribe uh connecting with people 
over shared kind of ideals and being able to bounce topics off each other, share goals, share what's going on with your life. What are you struggling with? And just being able to talk it out, I think is very beneficial to us, our human psyche, our mental, emotional well-being. And yeah, I don't know. That's well, my thoughts. It, it, it's so important. And yes, we are doing the Sapien tribe and you can go to sapien.org and find it. And yeah, I mean, I, some people are doing some of these decentralized communities online. I'm not familiar with all of them. I don't know if any of them have really become successful because when you go try to make your own, then you just have this small little yeah. echo chamber. And I don't know, they kind of feel like they just disappear. At least there's Telegram is pretty good. You can, you know, broadcast to the world. Uh, we have, uh, what else were we doing? Well, the center, oh, what I was going to say is that the Sabian Center, we do want to keep it going. I think there needs to be hubs around the country and the world. And people DM me about, Oh, what about Canada? What about, you know, I'm up in Sweden. I'm like, yeah, I mean, make your own. Start with a meetup. Start with a meetup group. Start with something. Have meetups, you know, M-E-A-T, right? <laughs> Have little barbecue meetups and, and do it. And I think a big goal with Sabian Center is to do that in major cities around the country to begin with. And so, yeah, reach out to me if you think your city would be good. Uh, we we actually are opening up to investors right now. We have a little bit left in the round with an investment round for Sapien Center. And so not only you get to sort of invest and be a lifetime member and get the benefits of if you're in Austin in this community, but also have equity in the expansion of the Sapien Center. And I think some people called it the ancestral Soho House. <laughs> so people know about Soho House it became a giant company, yeah. you know, and they have all these locations in major cities and they they're doing really well and you can drop into anyone and you know that you have your community there mm -hmm. and that's a little more of the artistic community i know it started in new york with actors and musicians and more of the artistic crowd and so we can do that with ancestral health crowd and i think that's my my bigger goal even beyond food lies and nose to tail like what is the biggest goal is to have hubs around the country and the world with the like-minded individuals that don't want to participate in the mainstream centralized society. They don't want the centralized healthcare. They don't want the food system. They don't want to eat processed foods. Maybe they don't even want the education. People call it government schools. I've seen these posts. They're like, they're not called public schools. I mean, they are called public schools, but what they are are government schools, <laughs> you know? And and I, I think a lot of our crowd does homeschooling or they do alternative schools. There's Montessori schools. There's schools popping up. I think uh, Tucker Max is opening some sort of Montessori type school near Austin. And I just know they're popping up everywhere. So, yeah, yeah, that's more of the community stuff. Yeah. Is and I was also I was homeschooled for two years. So I got into really? I had a little issue in school and my mom is a teacher by trade and she homeschooled my my, my two brothers and I. And it was like the best years of my my elementary school life. It was so fun. We got to do whatever we wanted. It wasn't like we became socially isolated, right? And it allowed it allowed us to just experience life how we wanted it to. And I think that, you know, the whole the the homeschooling crowd, like kind of like you said, in these new schools popping up are just people tired of outsourcing their children's foundational years and, and all the time, right? Like when people are when when kids are going to school. They're going from like, what, I don't know, 7 a.m. to like 3 p.m. That's like most of their day, right? And that, that kind of goes in, you know, you can have a conversation around like, oh, well, the reason why they're doing that is because people are working and they can't, you know, they can't take care of their kids. Cool. But things like these, <laughs> these decentralized schools, um, I, again, I am a huge fan of um, Tim Kennedy's uh, Ag 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 Agape, um, and he's, he's hosting a school in, in Austin. And it's really cool. It, it, it pairs um, younger kids with middle school age kids with higher age kids. And they kind of, it's all about mm -hmm. critical thinking. It's about having joy and having fun and solving like real world things like, you know, taking care of your house and solving problems and understanding how the world works rather than just like math problems and reading like old books. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that stuff is important, but it shouldn't be the central tenant of our education. And if you're in the younger crowd, like I am, you understand, and I'm sure Brian, you have this experience too. You get out of school and it's like, there's so much stuff I wish they would have taught me. Right. And, and 
what's insane. Yeah, you yeah. spend all your time there, and yeah, you learn some good stuff, and you, you get fed awful food by <laughs> the government, <laughs> the government lunch system. But uh, yeah, well, you don't learn life skills. You don't learn critical thinking. I I thought about this a while ago. I had an old roommate, great guy, awesome, super, you know, bright guy. But he was just a server, you know? He just worked at a restaurant. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. So this guy went to a public school. I got to go to a very good private school, right? And I learned critical thinking. I went to a great school in Hawaii called Punahou, which I'm obsessed with. It's K through 12. Well, now, actually, they're too woke. I'm actually over <laughs> Punahou. They're, they're, like, very woke about all these things. And they're going to wear masks for the next 10 years, I'm sure. <laughs> so, but they at least taught critical thinking. So I was like, what's the difference? This guy, bright guy just as, you know, we'll call him just as smart as anyone out there. But he's a server. Not that there's anything wrong with being a server, but I feel like he could do more and he wanted to do more. And it's like, okay, well, he just learned memorization of facts and he learned how to do basic math and he learned to remember the states and he remembered all the president, you know, whatever, whatever they teach you in school. While I was over at a, pub, a private school, learned, like I took classes called critical thinking. Like I had a social studies and English mixed class. It was like three hours and we had round table wow. discussions and we just, we broke down. We wrote, we read Howard Zinn. Have you heard people's history of the United States? It's like an alternative view to all the events in American history, you know? And it was like the alternative view that every other school teaches. It was exact opposite. It, it, it was stuff like Columbus might not have been the best guy. You know, he's coming in and like taking over and, just like killing native peoples and whatever, uh, taking over, you know what I mean? So we got to learn that side and we got to discuss it. And that was the big difference, right? If you could, what's a, you, anyone could learn these facts, but that doesn't mean that you know how to think critically and kind of ties into a book I've mentioned a lot called the deliberate dumbing down of America. So there's a woman, Charlotte Iserby wrote this book and it's really just a collection of primary source res uh, resources and information she dug up that showed how over a hundred years or more they shaped this system into making people into just worker bees and just basically deliberately dumbing down. So it's like they kind of didn't want people to question the system. They wanted people to be workers and they, they, they called it Skinnerian tactics, which means like how you train a dog. And that's kind of what they were doing in these school systems is just train you like a dog. And so you can get that PDF of the book for free, Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, find it online. But yeah, so I guess we just got into the education side of this whole talk. And I think not everyone has to homeschool, but I think there needs to be an emphasis on critical thinking. And maybe that it could be, I know not everyone has a choice Right? Some people just have to send their kids to public school, but you have the choice how you could translate that into more critical thinking at home. Yeah, I, I think that I think that mentorship and apprenticeship uh, is is really impactful because I think a lot of us, I'm sure Brian, you can kind of um, you know resonate with this, resonate with this um, that you know certain teachers maybe in our lives, or certain coaches and people of, that have a little bit of, of authority over us can have a really good impact. I'm thinking of. Uh, my teacher, my German teacher, Frau Zanella, and she had a really, really, because yes, I learned German, right? But it was so much more than that. It was critical thinking. It was thinking for yourself and, and you know, maybe dealing with bullies and, and you know, treating others with respect. And I think that, you know, you were kind of talking with your friend about um, who, who was the server. And I think that, you know, for me, a really big impact was my parents. And I know that, you know, everyone, you know, I was very fortunate that I had, um, um, you know, I, I did grow up in a split household, but um, I had these kind of good, good role models growing up. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be your parents. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a teacher. Maybe it's someone you work for, right? I think that you learn a lot of critical thinking once you get out of uh, the schooling system, right? Like I went to, I went to a uh, Penn State after I graduated high school and I went to advanced neurophysiology and anatomy and learned all this amazing stuff. And then I got out of college and I was going to go to uh, chiropractic school and I didn't want to do that. Too much money, um, not really what I wanted to focus on later in life. And I realized that 
you know, I was really behind. Like, what if, you know, Penn State was amazing, this college experience, right? Kind of get pulled into it. It's kind of like, oh, you're not going to college. What are you doing? But mm -hmm. right, having the, these critical thinking skills, kind of outsourcing that to people in the real world, right? Not, not these big governments that are telling you what's important, like reading and English and math, and you have to meet these scores. But it's like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe going to these like almost like these trade schools where you actually work with people mm -hmm. in the real world and learn to deal in business and learn to deal in like manual labor or just, you know, even now coding and, and whatever. It doesn't have to be manual labor, but it's more mm -hmm. so just dealing with people and understanding like life is about like relationships and dealing with people and, and learning to manage your own self-discipline and your own mental, emotional, and kind of like uh, mental, emotional states and kind of like um, what our friend Colin was talking about, the mastermind. Uh, you have choices on life and learning to change your perspective on certain things and handle your certain situations. So I know I'm kind of going down a little bit of rabbit hole, but mm -hmm. it's about, again, it's about thinking critically for yourself and um, not being the camel and taking on society's burdens and all these stories that were written, whether that is about pharma, whether it is about food and what the standard American diet is, uh, whether that is the education. And well, you know, I went to public school, so I'm just going to send my kids to public school because that's what everybody else is doing, right? Um, learning to think for yourself, uh, learning to find people that are that are thinking like that and, and building communities around that I think is really important. Well, you're talking about going back to the apprenticeship model which again, we always look to the past. It, uh, it's ancestral. The ancestral version of schooling is what you're talking about. It, it's working for an expert and learning a craft. It's learning from your elders. And not everyone has to go to college. And colleges are turning into these insane woke places that aren't serving people. And that's kind of what you see in the book, Delivered Dumbing Down in America. You're like, she wrote this years, decades ago. And, and there are people who guided this education system a hundred years ago. And w when I was reading this book, I was like, if they could see how it turned out with these <laughs> universe, they would be rolling in their graves, laughing. They could not believe it turned out so much like they expected. And I'm like, that woke me up. Like they wanted this. They wanted people to be not like arguing over crazy topics that just divide people like identity yeah. politics stuff that they, they you know that the, the, i don't want to get into this political stuff but it's yeah well i mean brian you can also re like a point to make out about these colleges and things like that is n number one the price of them is so insane the inflation of of the the, the price of college has gone up so much just because we we get out all these these uh these loans that you can't you can't file for bankruptcy on, and essentially because because the the supply for all this money for college has gone up, and the supply of people wanting to go to college, and they can just skyrocket their prices. And the colleges are essentially run by large companies, large scale corporations that fund all their research, that give them all their money, that are donating to them. They're run by them, right? So it's kind of this weird you know, push and pull and, and, you know, things like other universities are starting to pop up. Um, I want to say whether I, I want to say like Grant Cardone is starting his own thing. And I know, um, there is a, a famous, oh God, she's been on Joe Rogan several times who has a really Barry Weiss is mm. doing her own kind of university. And I think Jordan Peterson is doing something like that where it's like, we're done. We're done with this woke ideology run by these large corporations that is, you know, taking over the education of our youth and let's start from a foundation something that's cheaper that you don't have to pay to go all these to all these dumb classes you don't want to take right like learn how to critically think and and do all this stuff so it's it's at least in the education it's coming around it definitely is and and decentralized youtube you can learn anything on youtube right well, it, youtube is <laughs> blocking people. <laughs> but yeah yeah that, that it is right so people are just missing that in-person component so hopefully that will pop up because i the people you mentioned and they have online stuff and yes you can, you can audit classes online and all that stuff but people do want that experience so maybe that will pop up in the future where well just like homeschooling you can homeschool and then you can participate in all the activities outside right yeah. you can be in all the soccer leagues and basketball and you can go to arts classes and all that. So just because you're homeschooled doesn't mean you know you're an weird antisocial loser. So hopefully, <laughs> people, yeah, more stuff will pop up. 
around getting that that human connection side that people a lot of people just pay for college for that you know that connection side it's like where you network and where yeah you, yeah so well and then also like i challenge people um brian you were kind of talking about like like the hubs right so eventually you know we're we're, we're going to try and build these sapien center hubs everywhere but do it yourself right now like go on meetup m-e-e-t up <laughs> you can host a meetup on meetup we're not yeah. opposed to that but go on meetup organize these things and and you know, what, even if it's just once a month, stay consistent with it. it you, you wouldn't believe how incredible it is to meet people in these different communities. Like Brian, you and I went to this, um, this CPG consumer and product goods event, right? Like totally kind of not, not our crowd, right? Mm-hmm. Or more of these ancestral health groups. We met so many amazing people that, that whether they joined the Sapien Center or, or helping us with business ideas and things like that, right? going out into these in-person events and being like, wow, there's so many amazing people in my local area. It just takes a little bit of organization, right? And reaching out mm-hmm. to people and networking. And maybe that event starts with, I'm sure that event probably started with five people, right? And mm-hmm. now there's hundreds showing up every time. Yeah. Oh, you know what I just thought of my freedom rally that I had last summer? People were floored people were on their feet cheering people told me it was the best event they've ever been to part of it was because they were holed up during lockdowns they didn't have the community these were these weren't like young ancestral health people a lot of them were married and they're like i couldn't find anyone that believed in the same things as i did and this is the place and we had 220 people there that all were connecting and bonding and they they felt like they were finally around people that understood them for the first time. And people have been telling me that, oh, I've made so many friends there and they're still friends to this day, a year and four months later. And it's really cool. So that's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, we should move to the food side, food and farming. And that's another component of this decentralization. And I was just thinking while you're talking, decentralization is really just ancestral. They, they go hand in hand and you start talking about tribes and communities and you talk about Dunbar's number, you know, 150 people is what humans are supposedly meant to the max that we could connect with. And that's probably the maximum size of a tribe throughout history. And that's decentralization is ancestral. That's what, <laughs> when we were hunter gatherers, it was decentralized communities going around and then the vention invention of agriculture started the centralization process. So that's why I was just thinking why decentralization is the solution to everything, kind of. And it's it's also what we like to do in the ancestral health community is look to the past. It's because they're the same thing. It's like we are meant to live in a decentralized world in a more egalitarian society where people are more equal in you know these smaller bands. And maybe some people say that's not possible anymore. I don't know. I think it is. I think that's what we're seeing. The people I know, they're they're gathering in hubs and it's not just Austin and they're making their own alternative society almost. It's like the opt-out society. Just like I can live among society maybe. Maybe they still live. Like I'm in the city. I'm near I'm in East Austin. I'm like a mile from downtown. Less than a mile. Saving Center is a mile from downtown. But I can still not use the government's systems. I don't use the healthcare system. I don't have insurance actually. I don't <laughs> I don't use the government anything. I'm in my own world. We get our own meat from our ranchers at Nose to Tail. We get our own health practitioners from our community, people around us. We we do everything just outside the system, yet we still can live in the system. And then other people I know are getting a little bit outside of town and they are buying up land, you know, east of Austin, west of Austin north and they're just gathering and that's another one of i think a lot of people i know's goals is to just move outside of the cities a little bit in the next five years and have some land i'm not saying these are like crazy preppers which is but prepper i mean prepping is good in a way right it's smart it's thoughtful it's like it's probably necessary but i'm i'm not the, you know we're not the type that are buying like big of those buckets, you know, so buy a hundred <laughs> buckets of, you know, like we're not that kind of prepper. We're like, let's get some land and some animals type of prepper. And so that's why I wanted to talk about the the food system and, and nose to tail. Yeah. And can so, I, can I chime in yeah. for a second, Brian, something that yeah. I, 
you know, I wasn't aware of until a year ago and I just shared it um, with our friend Jake at the center. Uh, he was kind of talking about how his family owned owned cows. His uh, his family, you know, raises a few cows and sells them to um, to, to some of their family. And I was kind of mentioning him. I was like, you know, it's crazy, and we kind of deal with this. It knows the tail. Is there is such a bottleneck? And this is kind of goes to the story. Yes, centraliz- centralization is good. Some of it is good, right? Um, the whole idea between be, behind the USDA and the FDA was that. You know, in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, there were companies that were taking advantage of the consumers. Um, a lot of people know from our good old government schools, um, Upton St. Clair, and you know, people were getting you know things of meat that had rats in them, and and drugs were being created that weren't necessarily the, like what the consumer was buying, and and people were getting hurt and stuff like that. Good, okay. Let's centralize that a little bit. Let's make sure that there are checks and balances in there. But I think we kind of go on the the other side of the spectrum now where people are limited. You can't just go to a farm. A lot of people don't realize this. You can't go to a farmer in America and just buy products from them. It has to go through a USDA kind of checkpoint. And that is this bottleneck that goes in. Um, in other countries, you can just go to a but you can go to butchers, right? There there aren't really butchers anymore. It was funny. So we have a there's a company near us called um, Salt and Time, which is technically a butcher, right? But they don't buy it from they don't go to the farmer and bring the meat there. They have to go through a USDA processing facility. They have to kind of get the government stamp of approval before they get the sold. And I was and I was telling our friend Jake, like, technically what your family is doing is illegal. You can't just sell you can't just sell meat to somebody like that. Hmm. Um, and it's just, you know, this is I, I heard this concept from Rob Wolf and and just saying how it's crazy how many farmers in America you know, have these, they, he was saying how I, I believe in, I, I might be misquoting him a little bit, but he lives in Montana and there is so much pasture and cows being raised out there, but they have to ship it thousand, a thousand plus miles to Colorado to get it. Um, to, yes, to get it processed. And then they have to ship it all the way back. And he's like, the, the farmers are losing. So, you know, meat is already not that profitable of a business and they're losing so much money, which is their livelihoods, which would allow them to grow their business, to buy more land, to do more regenerative agriculture because of this bottleneck process. They could just give it to a local store that knows how to, they already chop up the beef. They just don't have the, they just need the USD check on it and it has to get sent the whole way over. So mm-hmm. kind of this idea of more local of these U if we have to go through the USDA checkpoint, bringing up more local areas where people can kind of, they're, they're, they're more, more of these spaces so that the bottleneck doesn't happen in these kind of these processors, which are mm-hmm. getting, you know, bought up by Tyson and Cargill and all these other large scale, um, agricultural businesses and animal slaughtering. The processing is a bottleneck and I know people trying to solve that and there's mobile processing yep. and there's a lot of regulations around it. And, I don't know. Maybe there does need to be some sort of regulation on a mass level because, yes, people will take advantage of it. But until we get there, I think we need to just have people do more decentralized stuff and do it on their own. And like you don't have to get from nose to tail. There's so many other options. You can go to the Weston Price Foundation. Their website has all of the I think they have every state where you can look up your area and find people that are doing good stuff, regenerative stuff, raw milk stuff. And I I mean, maybe we have to just go outside the system. I know a lot of people, especially in the Western Price community, they do like secret milk pickups. You know, they meet in parking lots and they're selling milk to people out of parking lots. And it's great. And I think we have to do that. Mobile processing. Some people are trying to figure that out instead of having to ship your cows. And it's a stressful time for the, the cow themselves the animals yeah. the cattle i should say they're not all cows <laughs> uh, they they're they're rattling around in some truck and they have to go there i mean the best way to do it is you get a, a bullet to the head and they drop and i know some great people like Terra Couture up in canada and they do it all themselves and it's just the best way you can do it and maybe the mobile processing is the next best way because they kind of do it they have a guy come out and then they have these units then and they can you know, do that, but then maybe they can't sell it legally. So then you have to sell it underground. But anyway, there, people are figuring this stuff out. We're going to be trying to help figure that out. I think that's kind of a broader thing with nose to tail right now. It's just us, our ranchers in Lubbock. And these are just four families that we know. 
and it's just them. It's very boutique and they just process it in Lubbock area and then we get it out to people. So there's not really a middleman. I mean, we are the only middleman, but we're trying to get that to Austin too. So if you're in Austin, we're going to be getting a lot of meat here and, and it, it is USDA approved and we can, we can sell it legally, but maybe other people have to do it you know, semi illegally for the time being, but a, a big initiative for nose to tail, I think is to go beyond that, or at least even facilitate hubs around the country. And so it's not just us in Lubbock trying to send it out to people. Maybe there could be hubs in each city. Maybe that's around the Sapien Center too, where we, we have ways to get meat directly without going through the normal channels. And another option people have is farmer's markets, which I always talk about on the show and I'm sure people are aware of. I was in LA, Concrete Jungle. There was like five farmer's markets around me. So Oh, and there's such a, there's fun. such a good time too. Like getting getting out there and connecting with your farmer and just meeting these people. And it's like, man, isn't it so nice to buy my kimchi from this young woman who's literally bottling it herself? You know, yes, <laughs> it's not as um it's not as convenient as uh, I've never personally get my groceries delivered, but some people do. No, yeah. no if you're yeah. if you're busy and that's what you gotta do. But uh yeah, I, I I personally have always had such great experiences. And, you know, sometimes farmer markets, like when I was in Charleston, South Carolina, I had bad experiences. And guess what? I didn't give them my money. I gave my people that I liked. Right. And so and then I found more farmers around me. And then I found other farmers markets that were doing things well. And that's the beauty of decentralization is you actually get to meet these people. And guess what? If they're a bad human and you don't want to do business with them, great. Don't pay them their money. Go choose to support somebody else that you do agree with and that you do have good experiences with. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I, I should talk about our nose to tail operation a little bit because sometimes I feel like I, I'm pitching people and I don't, I, and we talked before, and I'm very proud of it. I don't need to feel bashful about talking about our great products. And I mean, like our pork, a lot of people, pork gets a bad, bad rap, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it should, because most pork is raised in a warehouse and it, it is kind of like the vegans say, right? The, the cow, the cattle, different story. It's not like the vegans say they're not locked in cages. You know what I mean? But pork and chicken, not great. Not great from the ethics standpoint of the animals, not great from the feed, what they're feeding them, not great from any of it. And I think pork gets a bad rap for a reason too, because it has, it's fed terrible foods. They're fed high they're, they're fed basically like soybean and soybean oil and yeah it's and just garbage it's just stuff. garbage from processing foods it's that we eat it's, yeah and so it's all the leftover and there what the, the main problem with that i think is that high linoleic acid ratio they're getting it's it's this high poop up people are caught on to the seed oil thing by now but this is what i'm thinking that pork gets a bad rap because it is high in those same fatty acids that are high in seed oils. They have this unnatural diet, this unnatural living situation. They're they're indoors. And yeah, normal bacon from the store isn't good. I mean, I'm not telling, I'm not gonna fear monger you and say, never eat it. You're gonna die if you eat it. Because I support, you know, animal foods in general. Yeah. But the, I mean, we need to do this better. And so I think I, I'm kind of most proud of our, our pork because not many people are doing the low PUFO diet for the pigs and we're raising them outdoors. You know, we have our great people, the trotters. I got to post a video about their little operation. It's just a boutique operation, you know, and they raise them outdoors. They move them around the pasture. They're eating the, the grasses and the shrubs. It's crazy. I didn't know pigs just would eat. Yeah. Well, they just, and they're, and they yeah. And the thing, the, the whole story, like the reason why pork and chicken, number one, have these really bad kind of fatty fatty acid profiles because they're monogastric. They only have one. They, there's a difference between these monogastric kind of poultry birds, and then there's the ruminants like goats, sheep, bison, um, different types of cows and things like that. Mm -hmm. They're ruminants. They can kind of – you just put them on a pasture, and they kind of just live their life. That's what they were doing. That's what millions of bisons did on the open pastures before, mm -hmm. you know, before America slaughtered them all, Americans rather. Mm -hmm. Um they just kind of fend for themselves. You can't do that with pork and chicken and you have to kind of feed them. You have to, they won't, you it's, it's, they're, um, they're made to be kind of raised in smaller scale operations in unison with other things. And then when 
um, which our friends, the Meat Mafia guys, do a great job detailing on their Twitter thread. When, when uh, after World War II, there was this massive spike of the need for chicken, and they kind of started this competition. And then these massive chicken, the 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 demand for chicken grew, and then these massive chicken chicken operations happened. And that's where you get these kind of these, you know, w- like you said, like the vegans are right, like that stuff is not great for them. And I, you know, uh, since I run kind of the back end of No Tail and all the customer support. You wouldn't believe how many people message us just saying, man, your pork is so good. Like I can't get enough of it. When is it going to be back in stock? And we, we just restocked all of our pork because crazy idea, guys, that you can't just slaughter animals year round. Like they go through natural life cycles. And at the end of the year, we slaughter a lot more animals because that's when the animals are kind of get you know they're ready their to peak. they're ready to be slaughtered they're at the age where it's like okay this is the time when we can do it and you get a good product from it so um you know if you're looking for low poofa high quality pork we got tons of it nose to org, baby yeah that's so correct and i learned more about it because i i just thought yeah you just get pork whenever you want i'm like yeah if it's sitting in a warehouse you can get it whenever yeah. you want but if you're doing it correctly on pasture there you have to time it and so now we have a whole bunch of them and they're all ready now. And so, yeah, we do need help. We need to support the community to move them. We can't, Matt's going to have to go up to Lubbock and get a huge like U-Haul container of, of these meat products because we have so much of them right now. So, I mean, this is a pitch to the audience. I, mean, I have to plug this. Like we like, let's buy this pork. We have it. We have the best stuff. It's, raised on the organic diet like they it's nor no corn no soy right so that we have this special feed organic feed it's really expensive no corn no soy because they do need some supplementary feed they can't just root around and eat leaves all day (laughs) they need like a quality source of protein and other nutrients so we give them that but we do it the best way and low poofa and we also give them leftover like fruit and milk products like skim milk that's left over from around town because they skim off the cream and they're like hey what do we do with this milk Well, that's great protein for a pig. So yeah, I don't, like I said in the beginning, not many people are doing the good pork. I know Brad Marshall, right? Who I interviewed and he's doing his little boutique thing up in New England area. And I don't know, I know one guy like Anthony who got a little ranch and has like six pigs. So we we, we have the the corn-free, soy-free pasture raised. Enough about that, but you're right. (laughs) Nosetail.org. Yeah, and and we learned that we can start... Excuse me, we can start using the heads. So we're getting tons of pig heads down here in Austin, and we're going to have Chef Charlie uh, cook them up, which is going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. He uses the whole, of course, we use the whole animal. So he gets the heads, and that's what people used to do. Other cultures still do that, right? You get all that meat off the Why head. Why would you waste he it? Has his right? That's what happens when you're involved oh, with yeah. the processing is like you have a head, and you're like, wait a second. Why are we just throwing this away? <laughs> Why would we ever do that? <laughs> There's pounds of meat there. Yeah. There's so much good and it's so collagenous and so healthy. You want to eat all of that quick little recap on why he knows his tail. There's so many other nutrients in the other parts of the animal. People listening probably know about the organ meats. Yes, super high nutrients in the organ meats, liver, maybe the most nutrient dense. That's why we put the primal ground beef. We put liver, heart, kidney, and spleen. So that's all good. Tons of nutrients, iron, copper, B12, uh, so many other things that aren't in the muscle meats. But another thing people kind of skip out on is the collagenous bits and the other stuff that's like in the pork head, right? It's all this collagenous bits. It's in the bone marrow. It's in the connective tissue. Like you want to eat this. I think a lot of, uh, especially the carnivore crowd, I call them the ribeye carnivores or the Walmart (laughs) carnivores. You know, they just want to be easy. They just want to show up and get a ribeye and go home. And I don't think that's going to serve them long term. And th- there's a few famous studies that people mention. Like I think uh, Saladino has been harping on this. I've mentioned these type of studies a lot, where there is a methionine to glycine yeah. ratio, and that you can get a problem if they fed mice or rats the, the high methionine diet, and they're like, "Oh, these rats are getting cancer." And I think that's where a lot of these fear mongering around meat comes from. Is from that study. It's like, well, yeah, you didn't give them the right ratio of of the methionine to the glycine. Like you, maybe you you don't want to be in balance. Like our whole history as humans has been eating the whole animal and eating 
the, the correct balance of foods. And that's why I don't think supplements are great unless it's an acute situation to correct a deficiency. You want things in their natural forms, their natural ratios. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's just, again, it's always just going back to our ancestral ways. Like when you killed a, an animal and, you know, let's say we take half of the animal for the muscle meat. Well, we wouldn't just leave the half there and go get another animal. Right? Like that's just poor management of food around you. We'll use the entire animal. And then once we're done with it, we'll go get another one. Right? Um, yeah. So, especially with that methionine glycine, it's such an interesting story. But, um, oh, I didn't finish that, that, that part. But then when they gave these mice or, or rodents glycine with the methionine and correctly, they lived perfectly fine and just as long and it was all good. So, that's, kind of, I think why people are in the bone broth. Yeah. It's like, okay, well that has more of these, the glycine in it. And some people have to supplement, you know, some people take collagen supplements. And if, if you're not going to eat the collagen spits, you're not gonna make bone broth. Then yeah, I guess maybe take some, some supplements, but just know that it it's evolutionary consistent and it makes sense, not just from a waste perspective, but from a nutrient perspective. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Brian, so do you want to get to some of these Q and a questions that, you know, we were going to kind of ask you just based yeah. on kind of like your audience and things like that? Absolutely. I think we did cover all the things cause we covered community. We covered education. We covered the food and food production, uh, that the healthcare stuff we can quickly cover. That's sort of beyond our scope, mainly just find your own healthcare practitioner. You do, you know, they'll probably serve you a lot better and they're not indoctrinated into the whole system there's alternative practitioners all over the place yeah that, and if you if yeah, you haven't but, listened to um the joe rogan experience with a guy named bring him bring him bueller uh, he was a pharmaceutical rep and a medical medical sales technology rep who really changed my mind on like this whole system of how the doctors charge and how these um uh these kind of this weird middleman it's a it's an acronym i can't remember it um and then just how insurance companies and how they're just raking in all the cash and they're kind of screwing over the doctors and then how the doctors are like, hey, man, I got a lot of expenses, too. And it's like we all put all this blame on doctors. And don't get me wrong, doc, some, um, you know, my dad's a podiatrist. He works. And it's so funny because I'm such a uh, I wear all minimalist shoes and I'm all about foot health. And my dad is the complete opposite. He is the podiatrist with insoles and surgery and all that stuff. And they're robbing him of money. Like he, the insurance just won't, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, we used to pay you a thousand dollars for this. We're going to pay you 500 now. And guess what? Shut up because that's, what's going to happen. What, what you know, either we pay you this or we don't pay you this pick one. Right. And yeah. you know, that's a whole story. So as you know, Brian and I aren't complete experts of that. I would, I would say go listen to that, um, that podcast and there's tons of other people too. Mm. It's a great podcast. And then at the event tomorrow, there's a guy from crowd health that's talking about it. And he's is the founder of something called, I guess it's called, I think it's called crowd health where they, they do a sort of decentralized system where you, people pay into a fund and then you can get services and you can get more than just a normal, you know, approved by your insurance people. You get beyond that. And then it funds it from the pool of money. Yeah. So that's really cool. And lastly was finance, which not, neither Matt or I uh, are experts on. And we won't talk much about it, but I mean, I like this Bitcoin community, right? Like a lot of, there's a lot of overlap in ancestral health and the Bitcoin community because they just believe in the same things, just going away from the centralized systems. And so we're going to have some speakers on Bitcoin tomorrow. And I'm just sort of a fan in general. You know, I've been buying Bitcoin here and there over the years. Yeah. And it's, it's not that hard to, to think about how, when you keep all your money in an institution, that if that institution is run by someone else and that becomes corrupt, then that's probably not a great strategy long term. Right. Like, like I can kind of check my balance online on my phone and it's like, well, I don't actually kind of have that money. It's kind of somewhere out there and, and they kind of control it. And if they decide that, hey, Matt is talking about some crazy, you know, crazy decentralization mm -hmm. and beef and and you know, freedom on his podcast, like we're just gonna kind of take your money away. Like PayPal said they would, right? Yeah, 2,500 bucks. Yeah, no, this this is huge. And people need to go back and learn about the history of this. I'm a really big fan of some of these books of like Creature from Jekyll Island or something about the Federal Reserve. People understand how the Federal Reserve is created and that it's not part of the government. And that the, basically these powers that be, these super wealthy people 100 years ago, 
basically hijacked the monetary system from the US government and still kind of control it. And now what I'm most worried about is this like central bank digital currency, CBDC, stuff like that, where that's exactly what could happen. What Matt just said is that's what's going on in China right now. They have the social credit scores. They have ways to do that. And, and I think that's what's kind of trying to happen. They're trying to implement for the world, right? And, and you can see it happening. And some people think um, even just Bitcoin, it's like, it's almost there. It's almost like warming up people to the idea of th these, you know, blockchain stuff or decentralized things. And so that it's almost a trick though. So there people are going to think, oh yeah, so this CBDC or this new, well, it's like Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, it's the exact opposite of Bitcoin. This is just completely co controlled by the government. You're going to, 80% of the public's probably going to be all about it. And then all of a sudden, oh yeah, you're not, you're not playing by the rules. You can't do this. Can't travel. Can't, you know, or even with the meat thing, people call me a conspiracy theorist. I don't talk about this much, but You've hit your meat quota for the week. We see all your bills. We know what you're buying. That's too much red meat. It's not good for your health. It's not good for the planet. <laughs> well, they're you know? doing this in Europe. And they're doing this in Europe. There's like cl climate quotas going on, right? And it's like, it's not that crazy to think like, hey, if they if they think that me like driving my car is that detrimental to the environment, and, and, they, and they also say that meat is that detrimental to the environment, then it, it's not that far-fetched for them to be like, hey- we're going to limit, you know, your meat, you know, you can only have five pounds of meat this week and it's like, or five pounds of meat this month. And it's like, man, that, that would be a scary thing. And people are calling for it. Like you can look up articles right oh. now. People being like, it's just, it's wild. It's wild. Well, there's a planetary health diet and the eat Lancet. This is not conspiracy stuff. This is being done in the open and these giant corporations and groups and world go govern unelected people are coming together and doing huge things, UN, WHO, EAT, Lancet is a journal. They're all coming together. They're giant food companies funding this all. Dr. Frederick Leroy, PhD, that I interviewed yeah. on this podcast, mapped it out. He does a lot of great presentations. Check out his videos. He ties the puzzle pieces together. It's like, this is, the, this is who's behind the EAT Lancet. And it's just every big food corporation in the world, big pharma, big everything. It's all happening in front of people. And 80% of people don't know it, 20% kind of do. And I think that's the 20% we're talking to on this podcast. But man, you got to be careful of what's Yeah, what's and, to and to kind of summarize this before we transition to these, like, these last few questions and we kind of wrap things up here. You know, we mentioned all these resources. We mentioned all these people you can go check things out at. You, you probably have a really busy day. You probably, have, you probably have stuff to do, bills to pay. You don't have to go listen to all this stuff. Yes, they are good resources. We're giving these if you want to dive into these things a little bit deeper. But mm -hmm. the things that we talked about earlier, doing meetups, going supporting your farmer's markets, supporting local brands, supporting um, brands uh, that, that you enjoy, right? That, that are doing things right, that are part of this decentralization movement. That's how you can take action, right? It's like, okay, well- when You got to buy meat. Yeah, it's like you got to buy food, just buy it from exactly. the person. Yeah, it doesn't need to be extra time. Just, just kind of changing the ways that you do things now. It's like, it's like soap, for example, right? Like we make this really high quality beef towel of soap that's great for your skin, um, good for all things around. But it's like, you see all these people kind of talking about toxins online, and and it's like, you don't need to learn all this stuff. You don't need to go in all these rabbit holes around chemicals and things like that. It's just when you go to the market, instead of buying this soap, just buy this soap, right? Simple things that you can do. You're already buying soap no matter what. Right, you're already buying meat, no matter what. You're already, mm -hmm. you know, um, watching media. Right, just switch it up a little bit. Try some new things. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And I like that he worked in our body care <laughs> stuff because it is good. You don't want to put chemicals <laughs> on your skin, and you don't want to put like random oils and stuff that isn't yeah. natural. I, I like, I like my. Someone's asked me about it, and the simplest way I could describe it is, put animal fat on your animal body. Like it's what it wants. It doesn't want the other stuff. Like it soaks it up. It it's it's amazing. Yeah. But 
Go for the okay. questions. Let's do some questions. Alrighty. So um, these are some things that Brian um, kind of has mentioned over the little bit recent past, and I thought were good things that we could kind of wrap up this podcast in because maybe he doesn't get interviewed that often. Um, I know he did one recently, but we can kind of chat about some different mm -hmm. stuff here. Um, so one one thing really specifically, Brian, um, what are you eating on a day to day basis? What is kind of your schedule? Maybe what is your what does your plate mm -hmm. look like? And and maybe. Where do you, how about this? And also like, where do you slack off in, right? Where we all kind of practice this maybe 80, 20 rule. What is maybe your 20% mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily fit the sapien lifestyle and why? Mm, all right. All right. Yeah. I stopped posting food pictures. You know, I feel like <laughs> I feel weird just posting my meals on Instagram, but what I do eat, I kind of eat the same thing a lot. Like I eat for lunch. I don't eat breakfast. I'm not against breakfast. If you're metabolically healthy, I think it's perfectly fine and maybe necessary. I think there's so many different diets that serve people at different times in their life. And that's a nuance that we've lost. People just like, oh, well, I did carnivore and I lost weight and I felt amazing. And that's it. That's it. I figured it out for life. Like, no, no, no. This is like a tool. Like almost every diet is a tool and it's just how you use it. Right. So uh, for me, I'm not eating breakfast right now, but who knows? Maybe I will. <laughs> but for lunch, I'm eating beef sausage i'm eating local sh shirt tail creek eggs i'll give them a plug they are just pasture raised bright orange yolks i'm eating sauerkraut and i'm eating some local cheese uh, avocado i guess it's kind of local we're close to mexico <laughs> and and like pickles just just uh, basically have a big spread of food that is actually pretty low carb Right. I just like to stay sort of more low carb during the day. And I think this is kind of this longevity mode that I'm after where I'm not raising my blood sugar. I'm not, you know, having this crash after lunch. And then I do a workout some days during the week and the night. And then I eat more protein and more carbs for dinner, whole food carbs. And I'm eating big steak, a big nose to tail steak, some lamb. We do some lamb at nose to tail, maybe not for long. Get it while you can. Uh, <laughs> lamb's hard to do in the U.S. What and, uh, what kind of carbs are you eating? Like with specifically, oh, and, how, and how do you I, like doing them up? So I'll do sweet potatoes, uh, roasted sweet potatoes. I actually put the th our Thai seasoning on the sweet potatoes. It's unbelievable. It's basically, I started the whole seasoning line just so I could have the Thai seasoning for myself <laughs> and the dill, the, the dill and ranch. I put that in sour cream or yogurt and it makes ranch. Ranch is terrible for you. It's soybean oil and corn syrup. Unless you just take our seasoning and put it in, say, yogurt, and now all of a sudden you have a healthy ranch. So I use that as well. Um, I do I do a clean rice. Like if you find like an organic rice, hopefully not even fortified. I, I don't think you want all these weird fortification stuff yeah. and they add iron and stuff uh, with bone broth. So I use our nose to tail bone broth cook it in the rice. Now you actually have something with some nutrients in it. I'll do fruit for dessert. So I have the big hunk of meat. I have some whole food carbs and I do actually some raw carrots with some balsamic or apple cider vinegar and some Parmesan cheese. And I think there's a lot of benefits to that. And then I'll have fruit for dessert. And I think I sleep better since I've been adding more carbs in and I do it strategically. I do it once a day. Not saying that everyone has to do this. This is just sort of my little plan for now is that I'm in longevity mode for a lot of the day. I, I'm not snacking. I'm not eating a lot of carbs. I'm a pretty stable blood sugar. And I've tested this all with, you know, the different CGMs. And then I work out and I'm like, hey, I'm in growth mode. At night, I'm in growth mode. I'm going to eat some carbs that are whole foods and good and not covered in glyphosate and aren't, you know, processed and refined and they're not grains and they're not. You know, there's so many carbs I don't eat, but there's good stuff. Like I mentioned, fruit, sweet potatoes, stuff like that. And I'm in growth mode and I try to lift weight and I try to go to failure and I try to tell my body get stronger and I can be in growth mode for this short period. And maybe my blood sugar does go up. It's all good because I'm metabolically healthy and then it goes back down. And so that's kind of my main sort of philosophy about eating is being mindful of longevity mode versus growth mode about including good carbs and not being afraid of carbs. And, you know, I did, I, I think I, I, I went to maybe low carb for too long. Yeah. And 
yeah, I think it's serving well. And I, and I talked about this stuff with different people on the podcast about body temperature, even like if I, I've, I think I was getting a little low body temperature, lower metabolism from eating low carb for too long. When you want a higher body temperature, you want a higher metabolism. I feel like I can eat more. I feel like I'm eating far more calories and staying the same weight. Hmm. By eating just whole foods and and add yeah and and sleeping better. So yeah. do you slack off at all? Do you ever oh, do you yeah. ever go outside of it? <laughs> oh, I do, I do, absolutely. I I'm of the mind I'm going to do this for life. And so if I'm at an event, I'm going to eat what everyone else is eating. Maybe I just I'm I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff and I'm not just going to sit there and eat the, all the chips. But I'm going to not be a weirdo about it. It's more like social, kind of in social gatherings, maybe when you can't yeah. kind of cook all your your nice nice and tight meals like you would like. You kind of, that's where you're slacking yeah, off a little bit. But I'm fine with it because it's a mindset. I had a great discussion with some people the other day at the Sabian Center about the mindset of it all. It's like, I'm not down on myself for that. I am very, it's abundant. It's fun. It's like, I am having a great time. This is healthy for me. Maybe it's not the perfect health food and the moment, but it's healthy for me to be a normal guy, to, to enjoy different foods, have different flavors, enjoy my company. I don't want to go to someone's house and not eat their food. I think it's very mentally healthy to do that sometimes. If you're on you know, a strict plan, if you have some you know, chronic disease you're trying to reverse, be strict. Don't, you know, don't listen to me. Do, do your thing. You know? But once you maybe are, are more where you're at, I think it's very healthy to to do what I do and have a more variety. So what I don't, I think I slack off in many areas, but sleep is something I don't slack off in. That's, that's actually what I found I'm most consistent in is I will always get eight hours of sleep. Like I will, you know, I will slack off with meals. I'll slack off with other things, but sleep is something I don't sacrifice. Yeah. Cool. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. Um, what is something that you have changed your mind on recently? that isn't related to food that something that maybe you haven't really mentioned on this podcast before <laughs> well that's hard because i was always related to food because for me the, the big thing i changed my mind on is the the carb thing because i i mean people go back and listen i welcome people to go back and listen to the old episodes and i and i think i was more in the keto world right and i i was saying that things can work on both sides but i've definitely changed my mind about like carbs and that you know, glucose is a sort of a natural substance to the human body. Yeah. Um, in general, well, I don't know if it's very new. It's more about just how the world works. <laughs> I guess maybe that's not a good answer because I'm just repeating all the stuff we said about the quote red pilled <laughs> world of I used to just be plugged into the matrix up until like I, I did understand that the healthcare system is is bogus you know, medical stuff food systems are bogus but i didn't know the rest of the world was sort of bogus and um i i think i've just changed my mind on a lot of stuff on on that front where i look at the world differently now okay so maybe that's not i didn't reveal too much but i don't have any other good answers <laughs> no nah, no worries all right let's hear get your thoughts on this what are your thoughts on on elon musk taking over twitter oh that's a controversial one I, i'm <laughs> right in between so i love elon i think he's doing big things, but I also think he is part of just the big system and is part of the problem. So a lot of people kind of get tricked into thinking he's our savior, right? And you can kind of think that way if you if you don't look very hard. You're like, oh yeah, but he's he's for free speech and he's doing all these great things. And then when you think about it a little further, you're like, wait a second, he's, he's trying to put it in brain chips and he's and so, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not a fan now. I, 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 at least it's kind of voluntary, right? Like he's not like forcing brain chips in your head. You're right. <laughs> you know, like when, I, when you really think about it and like, kind of like look at more of what he believes in, yeah, he is, I think more of the same and you can go into his history and how he was, he came to be. And I yeah. think it's a little fishy and I do not trust him, but I think he is doing good things on the surface. You got your check mark now. <laughs> yeah, I got a check mark. I'm verified on Twitter because I paid the. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I'm going to get my check mark. Probably not. Um, okay. All right. Last one. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Shut up. Sorry about that, guys. Um, 
that is telling me to update some stuff with nose to tail. <laughs> um, all right, last question. Uh, Brian, you recently were kind of shadow banned on Instagram. And if I believe still, uh, you know, we're always hanging around the safety center. People are like, I can't, I can't tag you, Brian. What's going on here? Um, so maybe kind of like what, mm. what happened and kind of how are you, how are you working through this? How are you progressing through this? Yeah. So this, I, I posted a couple, three to four weeks ago about the Pfizer thing and how they didn't ever test for transmission. So this was just a big news story that wasn't covered in the mainstream. <laughs> who who would have thought? Uh, no, no <laughs> one's talking about it. So I just posted a newscaster talking about it, and they took the video down. They said it was misinformation, and they 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 stopped me from being able to do certain things, and people could not tag me. That same day, within 24 hours, I was also got another, a second strike on YouTube, and they dug up an 11 month old video of interview I did with a doctor about his experience. Just nothing. He didn't say, he didn't give any advice. He didn't say anything about vaccines. He didn't say, I don't know. He just told his story and they dug that up. A separate company, YouTube, completely separate from Meta, which is Instagram and Facebook. And I don't know. It's just crazy that they dig that up. And I'm a bit scared they can dig up anything now. Because yeah. in the next 90 days, if you get a third strike, you're off. So I'm just waiting for them to find some other video that they can just take down and be like, oh, well, you said this. And I appealed. There was no resolution. They just said, nope, it's confirmed. This was medical disinformation. So yeah. yes, and people still can't tag me. And I have no idea when it's going to return. <clears throat> and it's pretty crazy. I was thinking there needs to be a class action lawsuit. I don't know if this is going to happen with other people who are online. My livelihood is a bit online, right? It's it's sort of s supported by like nose to tail exists because of the podcast and from social media. Like I don't pay for ads. I don't do any of that stuff. This is just the community powered thing. And if they take away my community community, I'm screwed. And so I hope there's some sort of class action lawsuit. Yeah, well, there's some precedent being sent, sent definitely with Alex Berenstein, Berenstein, um, maybe, I don't know, uh, with with Twitter, right? He he got kicked off for misinformation and everything he was posting was 100% correct. And he got reinstated back and he won he won the lawsuit. And there's a lot of other stuff going on with kind of the White House and interesting things with that. But um, yeah, yeah, man, it is it is scary. And especially when there's no kind of there's no like resolution. There's no like, this is exactly what you said mm -hmm. that we are telling you is medical inf misinformation. It's just more like, here's the video. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, how, how do I know what the issue is here? Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, it's like getting in trouble for something and the parents don't really even tell you what you did wrong. It's just like, nah, you did, how you did something help? wrong. Yeah, that's not going to help Yeah, you. it doesn't help. It doesn't help you correct anything. If anything, it leaves you just not wanting to use their platform anymore, which is probably just not great business yeah. for them in general. So well, I think... I think Sorry, I think the problem in general with this is I am self-censoring now. So yes. a bit aside from the point you just made, but I'm saying the main problem is people are falling into line and I have and I have to and I still try to say stuff. I try to code it, you know, and say it in different ways, but they are successfully stifling speech. And I'm and when that story came out about Pfizer, no one was posting about it online. I saw maybe one account post about it, but I was like, where's all the noise about this? I'm like, well, I think people are scared to post about it. Yeah. And, oh man, well, good stuff. We should leave it at that for the day. Go to nosetail.org, support our family ranchers, support our great products. What else? Sapien Center, if you're in Austin, we're gonna, yep. ooh, we're gonna send out an email to, we gotta jo join the newsletter. That's actually a good one. Because we're talking about decentralization, newsletters are one of the things that can't be blocked, right? You can we can communicate directly to you. We do one email a week. Matt writes it. I write a little rant. We just give you an update. What's the newest content? Here's some valuable articles that Matt finds. Valuable information. We can talk to people directly. So go to saping.org. Please do this now if you can. Just go on your phone, saping.org. There should be a little pop-up thing on the bottom. Join the newsletter. Put in your email. We don't spam you. We don't do anything else with your email address, obviously. And we're going to send out an email about how to get involved. Matt, can yeah. you more? It, just, we want yeah, to yeah. And, and it, um, yeah, thank you for that, Brian. I appreciate it. 
uh, yeah, guys, subscribe to this newsletter. We don't we don't barrage you with a lot of stuff. We're just sending out one email a week right now. Um, it might become a little bit more than that potentially, but it never if we're never going to spam. Yeah, yeah. If it's if we we're only going to send it to you if it's valuable, right? Like maybe like, hey guys, pork is back in stock. Like that's some crazy idea, right? Maybe we're going to send you guys an email. We haven't given yeah. many discounts, but yeah, and um, yeah. So subscribe. We're about to uh, launch a really cool opportunity for people all over the world to kind of get uh, involved with the tribe. Um, one portion of that is going to be kind of a revamp of of Ryan's online community, uh, where we're going to have some um, some sort of like monthly calls where you guys can get access to Brian and we can ask some questions and have forums and we might have some um, some of Brian's friends and you know these influential people uh, that Brian has on the podcast to come in and and do a little roundtable discussions and also host a platform where you guys can connect with one one another. We can share stories, we can share ideas, share recipes, things like that. Ways that we can kind of outsource um, this sapien center idea of building community of de decentralized community all over the world. So mm -hmm. um, please, if, if you're listening um, to this podcast, go subscribe, um, keep your eyes open for that email. We'll be giving you guys a really cool opportunity to get involved and also opportunities to potentially invest in Brian and I and the sapien center, the tribe and knows the tale. Yeah. And you can do that from afar and, we want to open it to the community and there have been some great investors around town that have put in their money to the Sabian center, to this, these projects, they believe in the community and that, and they can be a part of this expansion. And, you know, I mean, not only is it good to do just from a community perspective and it could be profitable. I think it'd be wildly profitable if, because if we have this great community, if we can take this around the country, I think that's going to be valuable. So, Sapien.org. You can go there now and just look at the tribe. Um, also, the film, foodlies.org. The Indiegogo is still open. You can still pre-order the film. We're working hard. I got my guy, <laughs> Jay in Hawaii, working hard on this. He is not getting paid. They, If you go to foodlies.org and you go to the Indiegogo, you can pre-order the film. You can get the Eat Meat shirt, and that also gets you the film. And this just pays for our our composer, our graphic artists, stuff like that. So that is still very much in the works. It's going great. If you haven't seen the intro, got to watch the intro mm -hmm. to the film. It's on YouTube. It's on the Food Lies YouTube channel. And yeah, it turned into a six-part series. I think people are aware of that by now. And it's going to be so good. I'm telling you, this is getting all this information in one place. Cool. Well... Thanks for listening, guys. I really, Brian, thank you for the opportunity to come on the show. It's so cool to be listening to this podcast for so long and finally get to be on it. I'm excited for it. And uh, yeah, guys, thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone.